uh, I think we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, patiently waiting for this um, workshop to start. Um, my name is Tara Jensen. I um, am the project manager overseeing um, the development of MET Plus and um, working with the MET Plus team to bring this excellent package and framework to, um, to the community for use for both verification and diagnostics. Um, I am at NCAR RAL, um, as are many of the MET Plus um, team. However, we also have a, a, a large quantity of, of staff from NOAA um, uh, GSL um, that are contributing to the MET Plus um, development and, and support to the community through the Developmental Testbed Center. Um, so over the course of the next couple of days, we're going to be uh, trying to do many things, including introduce to people um, the, uh, you know, what the, the basics are about MET Plus, um, have the community tell us what they're using MET Plus for, um, talking about some metrics, uh, the metrics workshop that we uh, had last year to help us focus on what to add into MET Plus. And then talking about the, the future and, and what um, the community needs from that plus, um, you know, moving forward. So let's get started. Uh, first off, um, we have uh, approximately 275 people that have, have registered for this workshop. So it'll be interesting to see if, um, you know, everyone um, joins in, because if they do, then there's probably about 25 that may not be able to, to um, join the Google Meet um, if they're all here at the same time. Um, we have uh, at least 30 um, individuals who feel that they are advanced users of MET Plus. And um, apparently my cat just decided that he wants to be part of the workshop. So he um, wants to also be a MET Plus beginner. Um, we have 62 folks that um, feel that they are intermediate users of MET Plus, And then we have a whole host of beginners um, 183 that we will hopefully um, transition over to being intermediate or advanced by our next um, uh, workshop, which we will likely have in about um, 18 to 24 months. As far as the organizations go, there's a full list of um, organizations. If you go to the MET Plus workshop participants um, list, there is a tab where um, the participants are sorted by um, affiliation. Um, you know, there are, uh, you know, Quite a few um, individuals from NCAR, from NOAA, from the UF Air Force, um, from the Naval Research Lab, uh, from um, international um, organizations, uh, quite a few of the um, MET Office Unified Modeling Partners um, have uh, joined this group um, in, for the um, presentation. And, and um, I, there's like too many to list, so I'm, I'm not going to go into the list, but if you want to see who is participating, go ahead and go to the, the Google Drive, the external drive. Um, you'll see um, not only the agenda, um, which we're working off of, which has all the links to the, the Google Meet um, in it, as well as um, you know this, this group of workshop participants, the information about that. Um, you'll also notice that there is a folder um, for presentations. Um, and uh, that um, is being populated as the, the workshop goes on. Um, so um, if you want to go back and look at um, people's presentations, um, either um, you know, as they're occurring or um, after the fact, um, those are available to everyone. Um, and then when we have breakout groups, um, we will be working in this breakout groups um, uh, folder. The abstracts um, for each one of the um, presentations is also included in this um, overarching folder. Uh, just really quickly, um, some ground rules. Um, probably don't need to cover this too much because we've all been doing these virtual meetings for two plus years now. Uh, but make sure that you um, mute and turn off your videos when you're not presenting or asking questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question or post it in chat. And then, I, you know, um, please be courteous and respectful with questions and, and so forth, which, once again, I, I'm comfortable that this community will be that, um, that way. So um, just kind of going over how to navigate Google Meet, just in case you haven't really, um, you know, participated in a, in a workshop like this with Google Meet. Um, this is the screen um, that you may see. Uh, right now it has a presentation up there. Um, and down here across the bottom, you'll see um, uh, several different options that you 
um, can use to um, to uh, be able to communicate with us and and um, and chat and so forth. So kind of um, focusing in on that that lower bar area. This is um, mute on and off, camera on and off. Um, in fact, I am going to turn on those captioning. Um, so hopefully that will um, show. Uh, if you wish, you can you can see um, the words actually scrolling across the screen with closed captioning. Um, you can raise your hand or lower your hand um, uh, by using this particular um, little hand raising item. If you are presenting and you need to share your screen, um, this is the share screen button. It's a box with an arrow up. Um, if you want to see who's participating, you can come over here to the, the um, place where it looks like there's people and view participants. And then um, right next to it um, is the chat dialog. And um, I just see uh, a question uh, about recording. The workshop is being recorded, and it looked like someone was just testing out their raising their hand option. So, OK. So continuing on, um, here's the for day one. That's for today. Um, you'll notice that we have several sessions um, set up. The first three sessions are basically in plenary mode. So it's, you know, everyone is in, in this um, main Google Meet. Um, and then later in the day, then we have two parallel sessions. Um, and we've uh, put in, um, uh, you know, the parallel session in kind of a gray to make it stand out from the, the session, um, the other session. Um, so the session four will be in the same Google Meet. Um, and session five will be in a separate um, Google Meet. Um, and uh, so uh, what we're doing right now is we're just kind of going, we're going to go over um, NetPlus, its overview, its current capabilities um, later today. Then we're going to hear from some of the operational centers that um, are using NetPlus um, and uh, research labs that are using NetPlus. Um, and then um, just talking about how um, folks can contribute to NetPlus. Um, just want to give you options on, on how um, you can um, just, you know, uh, open up discussions with the, the entire community and so forth. And then, um, as I said, this afternoon, we'll, we'll hear from some of the um, users of NetPlus. So then um, day two, this is day two. Um, we're going to have um, more parallel sessions in, in the morning, our time, evening, um, for those in, in, you know, India and um, and so forth. Uh, and then um, we're going to have a, a session where we're um, discussing um, the metrics workshop that we had um, last year. Uh, I'll go over how um, the, the metrics were um, identified, and then we're going to focus in on you know, several of the, the different um, lists of metrics. The original plan was to have these in breakout groups so that people could um, you know, really kind of dig into understanding the metrics. I'm not quite sure that we have the, um, the uh, leads that we need um, for those breakout groups, um, the, the moderators. Um, and so it's possible what we will do is we'll just go through all of those um, metrics lists um, in that, that main plenary session as well. We're still trying to decide what we're going to do with that. And then um, in the afternoon um, tomorrow, then we're going to have the MetPlus team talking about ways that you can analyze your MetPlus output as well as add in flexibility through Python embedding. And then finally, um, during day three, um, it's a shorter day. Um, I would just figure that um, it would be good to try and um, wrap it up by about 12.30 our time. Um, so in the morning, um, once again, some presentations focused in on um, uh, verification of ensembles and tropical cyclones and, and how those, um, you know, it's used in the development process. And then um, that, then we want to have a discussion with um, all of you um, where you can tell us what um, we should be trying to um, take into account and, and include in our development plans for the future. We have those um, broken out into breakout um, discussions. Um, and basically, we're going to have the breakout discussions occur for 30 minutes and then um, allow everybody to shift to a different discussion group um, uh, just to give you an opportunity to contribute in, in two different areas. Um, and so we're going to be talking about um, cutting edge novel verification topics, um, how to handle unstructured grids, 
um, you know, what are the differences and, and what's needed for both operational needs as well as, you know, the research needs. Um, kind of a, a focus in on process-oriented or phenomena-based diagnostics. Um, what else do we want to um, be bringing into MetPlus from that perspective? And then just miscellaneous great ideas to, to catch um, lots of the other um, topics that, that we need to be thinking about. So that's day three. Um, as I said, um, we will be recording all the, the presentations and requesting permission from the presenters to post um, those recordings. Um, the recordings will be uploaded to YouTube and then made available also on the agenda page for the workshop. Um, this is the, the same thing as what we had done um, for our training series and it worked pretty well. It, it kind of ties everything together quite nicely. Um, I've already pointed out that the presentations um, are, many of them are already available or will be available on the drive before um, each session begins. And um, if you are a presenter and you're having trouble uploading yours, um, please let us know. We'll um, have you email it to us and then we'll put it up there for you. Um, and with that, any very quick questions about logistics or have they been all handled in chat so far? Okay. So I, um, with that, then we will start our first session, which is an overview of MetPlus um, and current capabilities. And with that, I would like to thank Perry Shafron um, for volunteering to be our session chair. So he's going to keep me on time. How am I doing so far? Am I behind schedule or am I good? Um, I have 12 or 1042 on my um, computer clock, actually. But um, I will still give you... Um, uh, full time allotted. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, we'd like to welcome everyone to the first session. Uh, first session will be basically an overview of all the capabilities of MetPlus, and we will start with uh, Tara Jensen, who um, we've just been speaking about the uh, MetPlus overview. Okay, you can start. Thanks. So um, what is MetPlus? Uh, Basically, um, it started from the core of the model evaluation tools, um, which was the first release was in 2008. Um, right here we have what is um, fairly well known as our wire diagram of um, all the different tools that are available in MET. Um, MET was developed to be um, basically like a suite of Linux tools that can be strung together using scripting in order to achieve you know, your, your verification or diagnostics goal. Um, it includes tools for reformatting. Those are the dark green bubbles and um, basically off to the left. Um, and then it includes some tools for plotting, um, for quick looking, uh, you know, to look at the data really quick and make sure that it makes sense. So those are the, the lighter green and for the most part in the center here. Um, it has a, you know, a, a stack of tools um, for statistics computation. Um, and diagnostics and um, calculations and, and so forth. Um, those are in the blue, um, and that's um, the, the heart of MET, model evaluation tools. And then we do have analysis tools, and um, there are some of our analysis tools are part of the, the MET package, um, which is primarily in C++. And then since then, we have ext extended um, beyond um, that, that core set of tools. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, all the inputs and outputs are um, denoted here in the gray um, boxes. And so you can see that we have a mix of output in ASCII, NetCDF, and PostScript files um, at this time. Um, MET also includes configuration files for sharing um, the settings and, and for you know, demonstrating how to use the tools. Um, it does allow for the use of environment variables um, to, you know, pass in um, so that you can integrate um, the configuration files into scripts. And then um, recently we've added in the calling of Python scripts to um, extend the flexibility to especially be able to, um, you know, read in um, uh, data that is uh, maybe not quite so commonly used, but um, is definitely needed for your verification um, uh, processes. Um, and, and so we're, um, once again, we're going to talk about that, hopefully see examples of that um, throughout the, the workshop um, the next couple of days. Okay, so then what is MET Plus? MET Plus is the framework around MET that provides this low-level workflow to accomplish verification and diagnostic activities. 
basically it's all the arrows um, in this wire diagram. Um, so if you were to um, want to uh, do some point-based verification of um, uh, deterministic fields and ensemble fields, you could use um, MET to, to use those, um, the, the data um, that is pre-processed through, say, like the ASCII to NC tool, which reads in specific ASCII formats, um, makes a, a, converts that into a, a point.net CDF um, file that can be read by any of the, the MET tools. And then it can be used in both point stacks for um, evaluating deterministic um, uh, forecasts and, and then ensemble stats to be able to evaluate um, a, a suite of ensemble members. Um, that output can then be passed into, say for instance, data analysis to um, aggregate over multiple, um, uh, uh, excuse me, multiple valid times and over multiple seasons or, you know, um, whatever it is that you want to accomplish. MET Plus, um, as a framework, also um, includes um, configuration files that help um, tell it how to drive the data between the tools to, um, to know that it needs to call ASCII to NC and point stat and ensemble stat and, and where those files are and, and how to, um, you know, move it then into stat analysis. And it also uses environment variables um, so that it can be integrated with workflow managers like EC flow and, and, um, and Ricoto and uh, Silk and, and um, the Rose Suite and so forth. So here's a, just kind of a splash page uh, about MET Plus. Um, I already talked that it, about it um, being uh, MET at the, the core. Then there's um, addition, additional analysis tools. MET Viewer and MET Express are user interfaces that, um, that uh, communicate with the database um, if you um, want to you know, interrogate your data in that way. There's also batch engine um, uh, capabilities within that viewer to generate plots routinely um, by calling them you know, through a workflow manager or something like that. Um, we've already um, briefly talked about uh, the fact that there's Python um, capability for um, ingesting data, but there's also um, Python-based diagnostics and plotting that are available um, in MET Plus as well. Um, we use the managed externals um, package to be able to connect different repositories to pull all these different tools together. There's over 150 um, traditional statistics and diagnostics available in MET Plus, 15 different interpolation methods. Um, it's been applied to many spatial and temporal scales and everything from, um, you know, renewable energy forecasts to um, LG Bloom um, forecasts to space weather, um, you know, uh, um, total electron count um, uh, forecasts and so forth. And, um, you know, we have a diverse set of both U.S. and international users. Um, here's just a, a few of the um, examples of some of the, the um, extended capability method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, turning things into um, objects and then being able to objectively um, look at their attributes um, and compare them. Um, that's included in, in MET Plus. Um, scorecarding is included in MET Plus. Synthesis diagrams like the performance diagram and, um, and plotting of those are included. Um, being able to look at um, your uh, errors um, spatially, um, all of that is, is um, included in MET Plus. And um, uh, MET Plus is, is basically focused in on using um, use cases to be able to package up all of the capability. And so here's just um, some of the types of um, uh, use cases or examples that are available um, within the MetPlus repository. Um, so here is just an example of, of if you were to want to, um, once again, um, do a, a simple evaluation of gridded data using a gridded analysis file, um, you would pass um, those two um, fields into grid stats um, for a single valid time. Um, grid stat would then compute statistics and, and write that out to an ASCII output or a NetCDF file, depending on um, what you need. Um, you could dump that into the MET um, data DB for use with MET viewer and then generate um, scorecard plots as well as statistics plots. I mentioned um, I, the use of um, what we call use cases um, or examples. Um, basically, what makes up a use case is the MET Plus configuration file, some sample data, and documentation. And all of that is up on um, the MET Plus um, uh, uh, user's guide um, website. 
So here's some additional examples of uh, capabilities that are within MET Plus. Um, we have um, neighborhood methods available. We have um, a lot of different types of uh, masking. Um, you know, this is an example in the middle of um, day-night masking. Um, here is an example of um, iterative um, masking following a, a, um, a tropical cyclone track and then being able to look at um, how um, the model performs within, you know, certain ranges of, of that path. Um, or if you just need to only look at the tropics, you can, you know, have a mask that only looks at the tropics. Um, I would like to ask if there's anybody who's not on mute to go ahead and, and mute yourself. Um, we do have automated with regridding within MET Plus, um, and as well as I've already mentioned, Python embedding. Um, ways of looking at um, multivariate um, PDFs um, uh, for use with climatologies and percentile thresholding. Um, we recently added in some ability to um, take point um, observations and, and put that into a grid um, similar to um, what is done for um, severe storms, um, uh, practically perfect prognosis and, and um, so forth. Um, and then here's a, a list of all the different, um, well, most of the uh, different types of, of statistics that are computed and um, diagnostics that are computed. And we actually need to update this list. This is from our BAMS article from 2021. So we have traditional statistics, we have spatial methods, um, and then, uh, you know, a host of um, diagnostics and, and statistics that are focused in on tropical cyclones. Uh, maybe it'll let me move forward. There we go. So beyond um, those basics, um, we have recently added in a, a whole host of um, capability for uh, S2S, subseasonal to seasonal, um, including uh, you know being able to look at uh, multivariate distributions of data, um, uh, looking at um, the density of tropical cyclones and tropical cyclone. Genesis and, and um, you know compare whether uh, the the predictions are matching um, you know what actually occurred um, or not, um, as well as um, you know looking at uh, a lot of the um, diagnostics associated with um, MJO um, and uh, in the tropics and so forth. Um, so uh, and and looking at things like Hoffmuller diagrams, um, you know this is uh, the RMM. Um, for MGO. Um, we've also added in some um, extensions of the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, um, which is uh, multivariate mode. Um, so you can um, uh, put together um, objects from three different fields or two different fields or five different fields, whatever makes sense for a particular phenomenon that you're looking at, um, and then um, have, have um, multivariate mode generate a, a super object um, which then can be treated um, just like a, a standard mode object um, and so forth. We are also extending MET Plus um, to, uh, have, um, to allow for views into different um, projections, things like radius and maximum wind. Um, we're uh, talking to um, some folks, um, Ryan Torn and, and his um, students and, and staff about um, putting things in, in um, the projection of looking at shear um, in the direction of shear and so forth. Um, so, and then we have uh, feature-based methods that um, help look at systematic errors um, and, that, and those, there will be a, a set of three presentations um, uh, tomorrow talking about feature relative diagnostics. We have a whole host of um, international collaborations. Um, I already mentioned um, like NCAR and, and um, NOAA, um, working with the Met Office and, and the Unified Model um, Partners, Able Research Lab, and, and the Air Force, and so forth. And we do actually have governance meetings um, every six weeks um, in order to talk about um, how to make sure that we keep um, our development on track and as um, streamlined as possible and, our, and make sure that we're meeting the needs of um, the core governance members. Um, those are, are listed here. Um, we have a growing um, library of online training videos. A lot of those were um, put together for our training series. Um, and then, um, you know, the MET Plus uh, uh, user's guides and so forth. Um, here's a, a list of um, all of the different repositories, um, but ultimately, MET Plus is, is the, the top level repository. Um, and then all the other ones are available uh, basically just so that they can be 
um, you know, used as, as components um, as needed. Okay, I, I do want to spend one minute talking about branding because when we first um, started with Met Plus, we had Met and then a plus symbol, and um, that became, um, you know, kind of difficult to, to work with. And so we've evolved. And, and so basically, because Met is at the core of Met Plus, um, all of our tools, all of our components have Met capitalized, M-E-T, same as model evaluation tools. And then everything else that comes after it is all lowercase because it's all, you know, kind of extra on top of Met. So Met Plus is, you know, lowercase P-L-U-S. Met Viewer is similar, all lowercase, Express, all lowercase, and so forth. So moving forward, whenever you're um, writing um, or putting together a slide or a, a presentation about Met Plus, we would greatly appreciate it if you would keep Met um, capital, at, you know, because that's the core, and then everything else um, is, is all lowercase. Um, we, uh, there, there's a, um, a lot of, of work being done to use Met Plus for stages and gates in the research operations. Um, for NOAA. Um, and so, um, once again, tomorrow we'll be talking about um, how that process is evolving and, um, you know, what the metrics that were identified and how we're bringing that into the MetPlus development framework. Um, I also wanted to point out that MetPlus is, is um, uh, supported by a wide variety of um, organizations. Um, so there's um, all, all of the contributors to the to, um, sponsors of the Developmental Test Bed Center um, contribute to, um, to Met, Met Plus development, as well as um, several different um, of the, the um, notices of funding opportunity for NOAA um, and, uh, and the Hurricane Supplemental and so forth. But we also, um, you know, receive contributions from the Naval Research Lab, the Met Office, um, right now, um, the United Arab Emirates um, is, you know, helping with development of, of Met Plus as well. So, just wanted to let you know that um, the the funding for this um, framework is extensive. It's um, quite a few different um, organizations, and and um, therefore it can be a little complex at times as well. Two minutes, uh, Tara. Thank you. Um, so, I uh, just wanted to point out, this is where you can get um, the user's guide. The user's guide um, not only has information about software installation and configuration and, um, you know, how to, to work with the wrappers, but it also has um, all of the different use cases. Um, and once again, the use cases are um, the configuration files, sample data, and, you know, a description documentation about the, the use cases. Um, you're also going to hear a lot about discussions board um, later today, um, but just wanted to include the link to the discussions board in the, the introductory presentation. Training and resources. We just completed a 20-week um, uh, training session um, between uh, November and May of this year. Um, it was one-hour sessions. All of those um, sessions are recorded and the presentations are available. Many of them are tied into um, using our online tutorial um, and, and so forth. So I just encourage you, um, after uh, attending this workshop, if, you, if you're more interested, please feel free to, to dive into those training resources. Also, um, we do have a lot of um, installations um, readily available for the community. Most of these are for the, actually all of these are for the U.S. community um, other than um, Amazon Web Service, and, and we do have Docker um, containers available and so forth. But um, if you go to um, the existing builds um, page on the download page, um, you can see um, where the, the um, installations are available for the community. And with that, I just want to say thank you um, and uh, call out once again. We really appreciate you joining us for this workshop. Any quick questions? All right, it is perfect timing, literally perfect timing. Um, yes, we have time for a question or two. Um, most of the questions on the chat seem to be on the fact that the slides were blurry, but that's not your fault. I well, they were? Has, uh, that thing has to do with connectivity. I don't, I guess, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not your fault. I found them blurry earlier, but, uh, but I okay. think... All the slides are available on the Google Drive if you would like to follow along with the clearer slides. Any other questions for Tara? Will? 
for the uh, visualization and um, database tools, do you have to have the MET, um, uh, I guess you could call it kernel, installed for them to be used, or can you just install MET Plus and will it, uh, or do they all have to be included in one um, build? Okay, so if you're just, uh, if you have um, MET output that was generated um, by someone else or somewhere else, um, you can just have um, the analysis tools installed on a different system um, and uh, to be able to do the analysis. I think that's your question. Um, they, it was designed to be um, to be able to um, have the, the core MET tool um, and MET plus wrappers installed, say, like on a, a, a high performance computer and then have the database um, tools on a more local server where um, it's more appropriate to have a database application. Okay, that, that, is, that was what I was getting to. Thank you. Um, okay, one, uh, one last question. Uh, Duran, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but let me ask your question. Hi, I'm Dan Benjamin. So my question was, uh, how, how many minimum cores do we need to use the MET uh, in infrastructure? How many cores do you need? Yeah. Um, it, it's designed to be a sing it, working on a single processor, um, so it, you should just be able to, to have one core. Um, we have actually added in some optimization. Once again, you'll hear a little bit about that um, later today uh, for GridStat, where you can do parallel um, you know, uh, uh, processing, um, and we're hoping to um, add that into more of the tools. But at this time, it's single-threaded, um, you know, just one core. Um, and you can do, uh, you know, more of a poor person's um, uh, parallelization just by, you know, spawning multiple jobs and, and so forth. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, then with that, I think I'm going to um, stop sharing and let um, Harry move on with the rest of the All right. session. All right. We're going to move on. Uh, next up, we have uh, John Halley Gotway also from NCAR DTC to speak about the current capabilities of the uh, MET, uh, MET itself. Uh, so John, and let's see, we see your slides, which is, we see your whole screen. Yeah, let me see. Um, what do you see yeah. now, Perry? Do you see just the title slide or do you see my notes? I see the title slide. Excellent, okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name, for those that don't know me, my name is John Halligatway. I'm the lead engineer on the model model evaluation tools or MET software. Um, I've been working with this code base in one way or another for uh, about 20 years since I started at NCAR. Um, this software represents the work of many excellent engineers, scientists, and statisticians. So I'm presenting the work of a large team over a large amount of time. And, you know, honestly, we could spend many, many hours working through the details of configuring and running each individual MET tool. But in this talk, I'll be outlining the basic functionality of MET really in the broadest of terms. So I expect that most folks attending this workshop already know the majority of the, po the points I'll mention. Um, my goal here is to give a brief overview to get us all on the same page. The MET software is freely available. It's open source, um, available on GitHub, and it's well supported. It's written primarily in C++, but does make calls to a few Fortran subroutines. The tools are highly configurable. Tara mentioned the use of ASCII configuration files, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in this talk. Our goal is to provide a common set of verification utilities to generate reproducible results for making fair comparisons across centers and, module, uh, and models. So instead of each group having to reinvent the wheel and create their own package, uh, we saw that the need for this community package. It was originally developed starting around 2008 uh, with the goal of replicating the NOAA EMC or Environment, Environmental Modeling Center's mesoscale verification system. Generally speaking, MET was created to compare gridded numerical weather prediction model output to gridded analyses or point observations, and then compute statistics to quantify those comparisons. You'll see in future slides that some of the MET tools extend beyond this, but this remains uh, a large focus of the tool set. So uh, here we're seeing an animation that steps through those wire diagrams, illustrating the tools included in each public release of MET. The earliest versions are from 2008, while the current version 
It was released, it released in April of this year. In these images, the colored circles early on or ovals, ovals later on when I try to squeeze more, more things onto the same slide um, represent command line executables. And the gray boxes represent file IO. So an arrow, as Tara pointed out, an arrow leading into a tool is kind of where the MET plus automation lies. Um, but those arrows leading in represent the input data, arrow leading out represents uh, its output. And those, Tara mentioned the outputs of, you know, ASCII, NetCDF, um, PostScript, um, those, those abbreviations can be seen on the gray boxes to indicate the types of input and output. So we've started color coding the ovals and more recent versions to categorize by function. Dark green ones are for reformatting, lighter green for plotting, blue for statistics, and yellow for analysis tools, which combine results across multiple runs. One of the main functions of MET is reading gridded input data sets. And so here, I, let's see if my animation works. There we go. You can see the tools highlighted in orange, and, and most of them are highlighted in orange, um, are ones that either read or write gridded data sets. Most of them do. Um, MET supports natively the handful of gridded data file formats listed here. So GRIB1, GRIB2, a few different variations of NetCDF, and some custom data sets for MODIS and WIMCA. Uh, which is a cloud analysis data set from the Air Force. A couple of years ago, we added support for Python embedding so that the user can write a Python script to read gridded data from whatever data source they'd like and then serve it up via memory to the MET tools. When reading gridded data, the metadata matters a lot. In particular, MET needs to know the grid on which the data resides as well as timing information, such as the valid time and model initialization time when, when applicable. MET currently supports gridded data on Lambert Conformal, which is the LC there, uh, PS for Polar Stereographic, Mercator, and Gaussian projections. It also supports data on uh, regularly spaced lat long grids, both rotated and unrotated. So there are a lot of details on how this metadata is extracted from each uh, input gridded, each input data source. Um, we have a separate internal library for each one of these. Um, and so there, that's, where, that's where all the logic lies. Um, so the MET tools actually instantiate the grid in memory, and with that, we can um, regrid data from one grid to another based on the user's configuration. Adding that regridding capability uh, to the tool set to the tools several years ago, I think it made life a lot easier for for users. So let's see, next slide. Okay, um, another main piece of functionality is handling point observations for verification. Whereas um, with gridded data, MET provides native, native support for different file formats. And so if one tool can read a particular file, a gridded file format, then all the tools can um, because it all lives in library, library code. Um, with, we took a different approach with point observations. So um, instead of reading them natively, we, we, we pre-processed them into a common NetCDF file format. So the tools here highlighted in orange um, process point observations, either reading them as input or uh, or writing them. Um, some of them, the ones on the left side are the, the stack of point pre-processing tools. So that's ASCII to NC, PV to NC, MATIS to NC, LIDAR to NC, and YOTA to NC. Um, and the other ones are read that read data from that common NetCDF point observation file format. Um, in addition to reformatting, these pre-processing tools can also derive time summaries. So for example, if you have uh, relatively high frequency point observations um, in ASCII format, you could configure the ASCII to NC tool to derive a daily temperature minimum or maximum for each station, and then include that time summary output in the, in the NetCF output for use uh, in verification down uh, in, by point stat downstream. Um, so MET, like, like with gridded data, MET also supports Python embedding of point observations uh, and this, this support has recently been extended to all tools which read point obs uh, in the latest version of MET. Um, I think this Python embedding support is rather basic right now, and there's potential to enhance it to make it more user-friendly. So as you uh, try it out, if you have uh, recommendations for, for how we can improve it, please let us know through discussions. I'd say in general, the, the plotting tools, uh, plotting is not a major point of emphasis in the MET software. Um, however, the, the tools highlighted in orange here do create output plots. Our team recognizes the importance of plotting 
and that motivated the creation of the MetPlotPy repository as a place for enhanced plotting functionality. The plotting tools that do exist in MET are provided mostly for diagnostic purposes, and, and they are very helpful, actually. Whenever getting started with a new gridded data set um, or Python embedding, for example, I always recommend that users run the plot data plane utility. So when, when answering MET help questions over the years or commenting on MET Plus discussions recently, that's been my advice over and over. Um, if you're able to run plot data plane that, uh, on your gridded data set, that demonstrates that MET can read the gridded data from the input file, place it in the right spot on the earth, and orient it correctly. It, in addition, running with a high enough verbosity um, logging level of output, so when you run the MET tool, you can, you can tell it how the, the logging detail level you want to see. If you run it high enough, then it also prints out the range of values and timing information about the data being plotted. So if the plot looks good and the messages look good, you can be confident that not only can plot data plane read this data set, but all the other MET tools will as well. The mode tool, which does feature relative verification, um, also creates an output plot to illustrate the method. And generally, MET creates plots in the PostScript image file format. The plot mode field utility can also write ping output directly, um, but it, that one's pretty lightly used. I often will run the image magic convert utility to convert these PostScript files from, uh, from MET to other formats when needed. So, you know, convert it to a ping or an animated GIF. Um, we do realize we could spend time and money to write other, to other image file formats, but it just hasn't been a priority. So I want to point out here, there is, uh, th if you run the plot point obs utility, this is what for many years the output would have looked like. Just a bunch of little red dots indicating where point observations exist. Um, but in more recent versions, we've enhanced it a lot so that, um, let's see, so that you can get an output that looks like this. So um, it, it, it's, it's much more configurable. So in what we're seeing here in the, in the bottom right, is a plot of model relative humidity output. And there's actually three different data sources of point observations that are overlaid over the top. And uh, I think if you look close, squint closely enough, there's some in gray, some in dark blue, and some large circles. I think those are, there's, those are stations. Um, so it's, it's much more uh, highly configurable, and I, I, I think it, uh, users may, may find it pretty useful. OK. so. Um, most of the heavy li lifting in MET is done by the statistics tools, which are shown in blue here. Um, the grid stat tool compares gridded forecast to gridded analyses, while points that, the points that tool computes most of the same statistics, but compares it to point observations instead. So both of these tools perform continuous categorical and probabilistic verification. The ensemble stat tool reads multiple ensemble member inputs and compares them to gridded analyses or point observations. So whereas with, with, with doing um, you know, deterministic verification with grid stat or point stat, the type of observation um, or the type of observation being used indicates which tool you will use. For ensemble stat, it, we, we work to handle both gridded and point ops. Um, the ensemble stat tool evaluates the ensemble by computing CRPS and, other, and rank histograms among other methods. The wavelet stat tool um, implements a scale separation and scoring method. So all these tools write to a common ASCII file format, and those files end with a .stat or .stat suffix. Um, the statistics are organized into different line types. So for example, scalar L1 and L2 norms are written to the SL1 L2 line type, and the corresponding continuous statistics are written to the CNT line type. So we have these uh, abbreviations uh, for each line type that indicate the, their contents. Likewise, for categorical verification, the contingency table counts are written to the CTC line type, and the statistics, corresponding statistics, are written to the CTS line type. So we don't have time to cover all the details here, but you can find them in the Met User's Guide and in the training resources that Tara mentioned. The ASCII statistics are primarily what gets loaded into the Met database, uh, Met DataDB, to be plotted using MetPlotPy. Met Viewer or Met Express. So while Met supports traditional verification method, it also provides tools for feature relative verification. Um, we already mentioned mode. It applies the user user configurable criteria to resolve objects in both the forecast and observation fields. Rather than comparing the forecast knobs value at each grid point, it compares the object attributes. 
Um, objects with similar attributes like location, size, and intensity are considered to be close enough to be matched. Um, the resulting object attributes are written to ASCII output files, and those can also be loaded into MetDataDB for plotting by downstream tools. So this is an example of a postscript plot that you might get from Mode. So here's some pre a precip forecast and then precip analysis. And based on the user configuration, those blobs in the second row of images show that the objects that were resolved and the colors indicate which ones are have similar enough attributes to be matched. Um, there's an extension of mode called mode time domain, um, which is basically taking the two-dimensional mode and extending it to the third dimension of time. So um, it also writes ASCII object attributes that can be loaded into a MET database. So these, these graphics illustrate some feature relative output. Um, there's other methods as well. The GridStat tool performs uh, neighborhood methods uh, verification. Uh, points that and ensemble stat support the HIRA or high resolution assessment methodology. Um, these non traditional neighborhood methods are related, but not technically um, feature relative. So, uh, the next category of tools I want to discuss are the analysis tools. Um, the statistics and feature relative st tools that I just discussed are designed to be run once per model output time. So if you, uh, if you initialize your NWP model and have output six hours apart for 60 hours, then you'd have 10 different output times. So you generally run point stat and or grid stat and or um, mode you know, once for each of those output times. The, 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 the aggregation tools are generally designed to combine results from multiple output times. So for example, the stat analysis tool reads those dot stat output files that I mentioned and performs a variety of jobs to aggregate the results. Um, I also include the series analysis tool in this category. It's designed to be run over a time series of gridded data, similar to the way we run mode time domain that we already discussed. So it computes traditional uh, continuous and categorical statistics, but instead of computing them as a spatial summary, it computes the stats separately for each grid point through time. The grid diag tool or gridded diagnostics reads two different gridded data sets as input and computes a two, uh, 2D histogram of values. And I think Tara showed one an example of the that sort of 2D histogram in, in her presentation. Um, I'd say that grid diag is not strictly a verification tool, um, but instead provides a look at how the distribution of values compare between two different data sets. A whole other category of tools that we haven't discussed yet are the tropical cyclone tools or METTC for short. They were added- Two minutes in, remaining, by the way. Two minutes, okay. They were added in uh, MET version 4.1 and have been significantly enhanced and ex expanded since. Um, they implement the methodology from NOAA's National Hurricane Center's verification package. So whereas the tools we've discussed so far primarily evaluate gridded forecast data, these tools process hurricane track data in the ASCII ATCF file format. So users will generally post-process their gridded model output through a tracking tool, such as the GFDL Vortex tracker. The TC pairs tool simply pairs up the forecast analysis tracks for time to find the points they have in common and compute track uh, and intensity differences. The TC stat tool is, is very similar to the stat analysis tool, but it takes the output of multiple runs of TC pairs and supports several job types for summarizing results over, over multiple storms. TC RMW for the radius of maximum wind. That tool transforms gridded data to storm-centric coordinate system that can be output, uh, that can be further refined and summarized by the RMW analysis tool. So uh, next I want to mention which tools use configuration files. So um, the function, one of one of that strengths is the degree to which it can be configured by the users. Um, the functionality of the tools is controlled both through command line options and the contents of these ASCII configuration files. So I've highlighted here in orange all the tools that support the use of the configuration file. Um, the config file supports many, many options, um, and they are well documented in the user's guide. They include uh, selecting which fields and levels should be compared uh, and filtering observations for that, those comparisons. Users can very flexibly define spatial masking regions over which to compute statistics. Um, the config files specify thresholds to filter matched pairs, as well as for categorical verification. Regridding of data and selecting methods for interpolating gridded data to point observation locations are supported. Tara mentioned a variety, I think 15 or so different interpolations. 
that's what we're talking about. And you have gridded data and you want to uh, create a match pair by interpolating to a point ops location. Lots of options for that. The MET tools make use of climatology data to compute some skill score scores and, and uh, both to filter match pairs and to define thresholds relative to the climatological distribution. So you could define as an event being greater than the 75th percentile of climatology at a point, for example. Options exist to filter data based on a land sea mask and using topography information. Um, and finally, users can select which verification method or methods they'd like applied and what output should be written. So again, I've just scratched the surface here. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Our, as you can see, our team's put a lot of effort in these tools over the last 14 or so years. Um, it amazes me, though, that if you look at the backlog of development issues in GitHub, we still have about 280 uh, development ideas or, or GitHub issues remaining. So um, each one of those represents a good idea for how the tools could be improved or expanded. So even though we've, we've been working on this for a lot of long time and have done a lot of work, we have lots of great ideas for how to improve it. Um, what questions can I answer? Um, before we get to the uh, hands, there's one question in the, ch in the chat that asks, what are the best alternatives to image magic when doing the plotting um, I don't know. This is this is not really a Met Plus question. I don't think, but uh, um, I guess someone is not allowed to um, use Image Magic on their system. So um, you know, on my on my Mac laptop, if I just I just run the open command in the PostScript file, and it it um, automatically converts it to PDF and renders it as such. Um, other than that, I, I I don't have. I guess when you have something that works, you just kind of stick with it. And I haven't searched for for alternatives. Um, if anybody else has alternatives to recommend, please post it in the chat, or that would be a good idea for a discussion topic. And we'll we'll hear more about how to create creating Met Plus discussions in I think this afternoon. All right, time for one, perhaps one quick question from anyone else out there. Uh, near, near on, near on John, near on John. Yeah. yeah hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, I am from, uh, NCMRWF. So I was just asking this because you have several formats, uh, to convert, uh, to, to Met input, but our model actually UK based on UM model. So, which is giving in PP format. Okay. So I think, is there any, I mean, future scope that you can uh, directly, we can give input, uh, to Met through PP, PP format. Um, so you're using the UM model with a, a gr different gridded data file format. Is that right? That yes, yes, yes. And what is, can you say the format again, please? Uh, it is a PP, PP binary format. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that format. Um, I mean, so whenever you have a, a, a file format that, um, so it looks like Marion's pointing out that they convert PP to NetCDF. So, but big picture, whenever you have a file format um, that is not natively supported by MET, um, one thing you can always do is um, write a Python embedding script. So if you can read Yeah, it, uh, I, I understood your uh, your concern because we are uh, now converting the PP to grip and we are doing whatever we, we are able to do that, that, that way. But our ultimate goal is to give directly because uh, to, because Rose and Silk, there are some uh, wrappers are there for running the model. We can actually directly give to that. I mean, met, uh, in a, because not separately running offline or anything. Uh, this is the way we, we plan actually. So I just wanted to ask whether you can, is there any future scope that you can use that format also? So I would say, you know, I've mentioned 280 uh, GitHub issues. That's not one of them. So um, that could be our 281st. But mm -hmm. just because we have a good idea that that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that we have uh, time and funding to pay for it. So um, we generally are on the side of writing down the good ideas as new issues. Um, but but then we all we we're cognizant that we have to find um, time and funding to to actually do the work. But I, I, that is not currently one of the supported um, file formats. But I know I would say um, we, you know, Marion could could talk to us more about this. I, I know she she's been making some comments in the in the chat. All right. Um, well, we're going to save uh, question, other questions for later. We are slightly behind, so we're going to move on. If you want to ask a question in the chat, uh, hopefully someone can answer. Um, we're going to move on. Uh, next, we will have uh, Minna Wynn, who uh, also from DTC NCAR, 
uh, who will speak specifically regarding the current capabilities of the Met Plus analysis. So, Minna, can we see your screen? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Um, and here comes, there it goes. Here and comes the screen. Here it and, comes. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, can we get full screen? I guess you're looking. Okay. And okay. we see the whole screen. So can you see the whole screen? Excellent. Yes. All right. Well, thanks to Perry for the, <laughs> for doing the segue. Um, this hopefully won't run over. Um, I am representing the the Met Plus analysis team, and we're a pretty uh, decent sized bunch of people. On the NOAA side, we have some people from the NOAA GSD side. Uh, Vinita Hagerty has done a lot of work on MetDataDB along with Hank Fisher and Tatiana Burek and um, Tina Kalb on the NOAA side. And Molly Smith uh, from NOAA GSD, GS, GSL, excuse me, um, has been a contributor to MetCalcPy and a she not only contributes, but she also uses MetCalcPy. So with with that, uh, let me go ahead and get started. So uh, Tara already. Oh, Mina, I don't mean to interrupt, but you have the the box that says you are sharing your screen still visible to us. What was that? You have the the box that says you are still you are sharing your entire screen is still visible to us on top of your slide. Can you see that? Let me see. Or you this. can. You are sharing your entire screen. Can you like maybe Not. in the three dots you can remove that box, but still share the screen. Yeah, let me just uh, let me let me just share a window, perhaps. Mm, no, no, that usually can do weird things. But <laughs> let's see how does how is this? Okay, now I'm gonna go run. <laughs> now I'm gonna that's, run. that's good. There's no box there. And, uh, <laughs> you still see it? Uh, yes, we see. We also see the um, the slides to the left as well. I don't know if you have it on screens on. Um, Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. Can, you, can you go into presentation mode? Minna? Presentation mode is what I'm saying. Okay. Let me do this. My apologies. Uh, I was trying to use because people were complaining about the uh, quality of the slides in Google. Um, I was trying to use PowerPoint. So let me go ahead and try this again. How's that? Um, you still have the, the box that says you are sharing your entire screen. Is there a way to remove that? That's all. I guess, I guess it's now this off the slide. It's probably fine. <laughs> Okay, there we go. All right. So Tara had mentioned uh, in her intro about the user interfaces. Oops. And uh, for the MedPlus analysis tools, there's two facets to them. There's the unit user interface side, and then there's the supporting components. And so let's start off with the user interface side. So those are web-based, and they do require a database. So the thing, the MetViewer was uh, developed in from the NCAR side, and then MetExpress was developed from the NOAA side. And you can install your own instance of MetViewer as long as you have a database. And the uh, code is available in a public GitHub, GitHub repository, which, which I have a link down below. And then there are instructions that we all have um, under Read the Docs. Um, in the user's guide. So those will give you instructions on how to get things set up and what pieces you need in order to get a um, MetViewer instance going on your in your uh, environment. And then MetExpress is available to the public for use. Um, and there's a link down down underneath that, that uh, bullet where you can go ahead and cl hopefully click on it and play around with it. It's a really cool tool. 
And then there are also, there's also documentation on that. Um, I'm going to focus um, further slides on MetViewer because uh, Molly will be talking about MetExpress in a later session. And uh, so then there's the second part of the MetPlus analysis tools, which are the supporting components. And the latest version we, are, we have uh, released is version 1.1.0. And we are the latest addition to the MetPlus uh, framework. So that's why our version numbers are lower than all the other MetPlus components. So we have three, three major players. We have MetDataDB, and we are going to be renaming that very soon to MetDataIO. So you will hear me interchangeably saying MetDataDB or MetDataIO, and it's going to be MetDataIO. But currently, the name of the, the repository is, is still named MetDataDB. And uh, then we have MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy, and those are all three publicly available or publicly accessible GitHub repositories. So I stole this um, from uh, this lovely slide from Tara, and it gives you a really good overview of how things play with one another. So somebody kind of stole my thunder and asked a question about Met and do you need Met in order to use the Met Plus analysis tools. And here you see this, this big orange box with MetPlus as the big umbrella. And then you see in the blue box, the model evaluation tools. And so what you do is you can, you can either run the Met, the Met tools yourself or grab output from somebody else's run and then feed that into the MetDB load that is part of the MetDataIO slash MetDataDB um, analysis tool. That'll store things either into a database or go directly or, or can go directly into a MetCalcPy to do some further statistics. MetCalcPy output then can then go into MetPlotPy, or the MetCalcPy output can go into MetViewer or MetExpress to generate the plots. And then here's a more drilled down look at just the analysis tools part of that, where you can see. Um, we can take MET output or VSD, VSBD output, I think it's VSDB, anyway, um, and put that into a, 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 into a MET database. Um, and then from there, it can go either into a batch engine or, or the, one of the web interfaces using METCalcPy and METPlotPy. And then you can ge generate plots or scorecard depending on which uh, tool you're using. So METViewer can, can uh, generate the plots and the scorecard. And I believe MetExpress just generates plots for now. Um, the packages you'll need in order to install MetViewer is you'll it's it's developed using Java. You will need a database, either MySQL or MariaDB. If you are working in the cloud, you'll need Aurora, and we are using Python and Tomcat. And again, I shamelessly stole these next three slides from Tara. These are just some pretty pictures of what's available through MetViewer. So you have some traditional statistics and plots, like series, box, contour, bar plots. And then you also have ensemble and probability plots, like rank histogram, reliability, rock, et cetera. And then finally, we have some synthesis diagrams, like your scorecards, Taylor diagram, and performance diagram. And then next up, um, let's see, some details, some, some further details. So uh, the repository, as I mentioned before, is a public repository. It is going to be renamed MetDataIO probably in the next beta release, but definitely for the 2.0 release. Uh, we have a user's guide in, in, under Read the Docs. We recommend you look at the latest version. And, it, and a reminder, these are Python-based. So the the MetDataDB code is Python-based, and it supports both MetViewer and MetExpress. And the two major packages right now are MetDataDB and MetReadNC. And we will definitely have more packages um, that are going to, to, to be added to this because to match up with the new name, uh, because we're not just doing data, uh, no, we're not just doing database uh, functions anymore. So the metadata DB package is used for reading and loading your data into the database. It also supports reading your mode, your mode time domain, met, VSDB stat files, and the TCST, which are the tropical cyclone, tropical cyclone statistics. Uh, output files. 
And MET Read NC is reading in NetCDF data into a pandas data frame. So we're trying to make uh, reading in NetCDF files a little more easily easier uh, for for further uh, like MetCalpy and MetPlotPy use. And then uh, dependencies. So this is written entirely in Python. We have migrated away from Python 3.6. So versions 1.0 and 1.1.0 were developed in Python 3.6, and the, co the corresponding third-party packages are play well with Python 3.6. We've now migrated to Python 3.8.6. The weird numbering system is so that we can support the um, high-performance uh, computing stack that's a, that NOAA has, so that's why we're at 3.8.6. Again, MySQL or MariaDB database is necessary. If you're working in the cloud, then you would be using AuroraDB. And then we have just a handful of third-party uh, Python packages, so it's pretty a pretty lean um, package. And then now, let's move on to the next layer. So we've got MetCalcPy. And again, here's the link to the public repository. And the 1.0 and 1.1 versions are also available on PyPI, the Python package index. So there's a link there. We have the latest user's guide on read the docs, so you can follow that link. And these uh, tools in MetCalcPy are used both by MetViewer and MetPlotPy. You can also import them and use them like you would SciPy or NumPy. Uh, so what we do is we support statistics, diagnostics, any kind of pre-processing, and other related utilities that can be reused. And just a reminder, uh, MetCalcPy and MetDataDB are like what you would import, uh, so they're like libraries. MetPlotPy, on the other hand, is just a, a bunch of, not just, it's, it's scripts to run plots. So there's a, a little bit of difference in the usage of the two. So just a, a highlight of, or just a, a quick, show of how MetCalpy would be used is you would import it like you would any other thing. And the same thing goes for MetDataDB. So in this instance, uh, the MetPlotPy rock diagram uses some utilities, uh, utility modules from MetCalpy in handling um, statistics. And of course, the dependencies, again, this is written entirely in Python. We're at 3.8.6. And you definitely need stats models uh, to, to uh, handle a lot of the statistics. Uh, and then we have a handful, another handful, maybe more, of uh, third-party Python packages. And you will need uh, to also have MetDataDB if you're using the read file um, module, so if you're doing any reading of NetCDF files. And then the final component is MetPlotPy, which is basically a bunch of scripts for you to generate plots. And so we have the public repository under that link and the users, the latest user guide available under read the docs. Uh, the, we also, if you want to peer at the, and this goes with the other uh, analysis tools, if you want to look at the late, uh, the other, uh, in, in the development uh, versions of the documentation, they're also under read the docs, but we just recommend that you look at the latest version of the documentation. And so there are two pieces of the MetPlotPy code. We have um, contributed plots, and then we have plots that support MetViewer. And so the contributed plots can come from internal or external. And some of those plots that are internal predated the, the creation of MetPlotPy, so there might not be documentation for those. Um, and then we have some code that are from contributors that are Outside of DTC, for instance, um, Naval Research Lab, we have some a lot of uh, uh, plots from NOAA, PSL, GSD, WPC. The University of Chicago has also contributed. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but if I have, my apologies. Um, and then we have the plots that support MetViewer. So historically, MetViewer, the plotting was done through R script, and so we spent a considerable amount of time converting all of those R scripts into Python. So those of you who have used NetViewer in the past will now notice that they might have a slight change in the look of the uh, plots because we've migrated away from R script and now all of the plots that are generated in NetViewer are done using Python. So um, we have a, a, 
a basic usage pattern for creating the MetplotPy plot plots that are used by MetViewer, and we have two required configuration files, a default configuration file. So that default configuration file is basically corresponds to when you pull open the MetViewer uh, user interface, you'll notice some, some of the, the tabs are already filled in with, with values. So that's that corresponds to the default configuration file. The custom configuration file is what you would use to override, and so that's what you would use to customize like your title colors and, and things like that. Um, let's see. And so here is a list of, I hope I haven't missed every, anything. There are, here's a list of the plots that MetViewer uses uh, to create its plots. And so uh, these all have instructions under the Read the Docs documentation on how to create them. They all pretty much follow the same uh, instructions on how to set them up and run them. But so there's a fairly extensive list of plots. And then we have a growing list of contributed plots. And I highly recommend you look at the Read the Docs documentation because since these were contributed, they don't always follow the same pattern for um, running. So uh, we've got the difficulty index, Hubmiller, which uh, um, Tara showed. We have S2S, the subseasonal to seasonal blocking plots, uh, just a plethora of uh, really nice plots. And then um, I just basically showed a little mosaic, and I don't know what you call it, a little patchwork of the um, contributed plots that also have corresponding MetPlus use cases. So you can run the MetPlus wrappers use cases and generate the polar plot, a difficulty index plot, and a Hubmiller plot. And of course, the MetPlotPy comes with dependencies. Python um, definitely need uh, plot, MetPlotPy or PlotPy with Kaleido. Uh, the reason why we have a mixed bag of MetPlotPy, MetPlotLib, and Plotly is because we tried to, wherever possible, generate or develop these plots in Plotly. Um, but uh, some of these plots, so Plotly doesn't support a lot of things. So sometimes you have to write or develop in matplotlib. And also, some of the contributed plots are also provided to us in matplotlib. So we will accept either matplotlib or plotly. We prefer plotly if you're contributing. And then there's a handful of other. Two um, minutes, by the way. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm running over. Three, there's also a handful of other third party packages, but you'll definitely need to also have the, the concurrent version of metcalpy installed. And then a uh, caveat if you're using a contributed plot, there, there might be some extra third-party packages that you'll need in addition to these. All right, yay. All right, so are there any questions? Oh, actually, you, you used the time very well, considering that we had the um, <laughs> issues earlier. Um, are there any questions? Was there are the ones in the, looks like the ones in the chat were have been resolved on chat, so... Um, if there are any other questions for Minna, please raise those hands. Uh, time for a couple. All right, seeing none, why don't we move on and stay on time somewhat, even though we're still a bit over. Um, last talk of this session will be given by George McCabe, also of DTC NCAR. Uh, this George will be focusing his uh, comments on the MetPlus utilities or MetPlus tools. Um, George, there you are. Let's see the screen. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you does, can everybody see the title slide? We can see it, and we can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is George McCabe. I'm part of the MetPlus team. Uh, primarily work on the MetPlus wrappers, Python scripts, um, but kind of dabble in, in all sorts of other areas inside the MetPlus team. Um, I'm going to talk about the current capabilities of the MetPlus wrappers. Um, there's a lot of information I'm going to cram into this short session. Um, so I refer to this session as the MetPlus in a nutshell. Um, so first of all, I want to point your attention to the MetPlus user's guide. Um, there's a lot of information in there of how to get started uh, with installation and setup many use case examples to, um, to see how other people use the tools, and a lot of information about the configuration settings that you can, um, that you can set. 
And um, th this talk will mostly focus on those configurations, uh, but it'll be a very high level overview. Um, so I highly recommend it navigating there at some point and reading through the, at least the system configuration section as there's a lot of good information in there that was not will not be covered in detail here. Um, so first of all, what are the MET Plus wrappers? Um, they are a set of highly configurable Python scripts and they're designed to generate commands to run the various MET Plus components. Um, so numerous calls to the MET applications or now um, loading data into a database or um, generating plots can be handled with a single MET plus use case. So here we see many calls to grid stat processing different times and many calls to stat analysis processing different fields. And all of those commands can be call, generated from a single call to the run, run MET plus script using a use case configuration file. So the MET plus use cases are configuration files that are provided in the MET plus repository. And these are examples of how to use the MET plus tools. And they are grouped by category. So we have the MET tool wrapper directory and that contains subdirectories of use cases that um, run one, one of these tools at a time and show you how you can get started configuring a single tool. And then the model applications uh, contains many subdirectories of categories of uh, real applications of, of these um, of use cases that um, show real application of these, um, sorry, I'm stumbling my words. Um, they typically run more than one tool and show a sort of end-to-end -end example of how to use these tools together to do a, uh, perform analysis. Um, the MetPlus configuration files um, typically contain a config section header at the top of the file. That's the word config inside square braces. Um, and it uses the any key value format. So um, here's an example if you have a variable name and then equal sign and the value that you'll set. You will set. Um, these files can also contain a user nvar section header. And this section is used to, to set user defined environment variables. Um, so here we have my nvar equals my value. And this is the equivalent of calling my nvar equals my value in your shell command prompt before running that plus. Um, so that's useful for setting environment variables just for your use case. Um, typically this is used if you have a script that you're calling and you need to pass information to that script. Um, this is one way to get that information as you can reference the environment variable that will set be set inside your script. Um, we typically think of MET plus configuration files as being one of two types. One is a use case configuration file. This contains settings specific to a given use case. This includes information um, such as the processes to run, timing information, file name templates and directories for your input and output files, and any MET configuration set settings that you need to override from the defaults. Then we also have user configuration files, and th these contain settings specific to the user and the user's environment. This contains um, settings such as the output directory where you're gonna write your output files, um, the location of the MET installation to use, and then other user preferences that you want to apply to all of your runs. And I'll get into some details of these now. Um, so in the use case configuration files, the processes are controlled by the variable called process list. And this defines a list of the wrappers to run. Um, the use cases under met tool wrapper call a single tool in the process list. So here we have an example calling grid stat. And the use cases under model applications typically call more than one tool. So here we have PCP combine and then grid stat. Timing information. Um, loop, the loop by variable controls whether you will loop over initialization times or valid times. To loop over initialization times, you'll set loop by to init or retro, and to loop by valid times, you'll set loop by equal to valid or real time. If you set loop by equal to init or retro, then that you have to set the corresponding init underscore variables. Um, here's an example. We have the beginning and end time of your loops. Uh, the time format determines the uh, precision, essentially, of your begin and end time. Um, these follow the Python date util time formats. So here we have percent wise for year, month, day, and hour. And so the beginning and end times must match that format. And then finally, we have the init increment. This tells um, the wrappers 
the amount of time to add to each runtime to compute the next runtime to process. So here we have one capital H, which is one hour. Um, the default are the default uh, precision are seconds, but you can specify years, months, days, hours, minutes, or seconds using uh, a, the corresponding letter afterwards. Um, so here's an example. We have the init begin and an init end. Um, so we start at 9Z on June 22nd, 2022, and increment one hour to 10Z. And so this will process two initialization times. Um, I just want to demonstrate here, if you have the same begin and end time, but an increment of two hours, it will run the 9Z time, then increment to 11Z, which is after the end time. So it will stop execution and not process that 11Z time. So I just want to make sure that you're aware that the end time is not necessarily a time that will be processed in the run, depending on what your increment is set to. Um, similarly, if you set loop by to valid or real time, you will have to set the corresponding valid underscore variables. Uh, these are named very similarly and, ha and follow the same format. So here in this example, uh, similar to the same times for the beginning and end, but they are valid times. So it will run 9Z, uh, valid at 9Z and valid at 10Z. Um, this gets more important once, once you incorporate some forecast leads in your configuration. Um, so the lead sequence or lead SEQ defines the list of forecast leads to process. So here, if you have lead sequence equal three and six, it will process the three hour and six hour forecast leads. Uh, the default units are hours unless you specify them explicitly. Um, so for example, if you needed to process a 30 minute and 45 minute forecast lead, um, you can set that using the capital M notation. Um, so back to the init example, if you're processing uh, the, the same init times uh, with three and six hour forecast leads, um, it will start with the 9Z initialization time and then process the three hour forecast lead and the valid time will be computed. So here it'll be 12Z. And then it will move on to the six hour forecast lead for the same initialization time, valid at 15Z. And then it will increment the initialization time to 10 Adding the three hour forecast lead gives you 13 Z valid time. And then finally the six hour lead gives you the 16 Z valid time. Um, similarly here, if you're looping by valid time, um, it will process each forecast lead for each valid time and it will subtract the lead time from the valid time to compute the initialization time. And this becomes um, more important once you incorporate file name templates and directories. Uh, so these define paths to the input and output files um, using file, file name template tags that are substituted with values for each runtime. Um, there are variables that end with DIR, and those designate the static path to the data directory. And then a corresponding variable that ends with underscore template, um, and that defines the path relative to the corresponding directory that contains timing information that varies for each run. Um, so here's an example. The forecast input to gridstat is defined by the forecast gridstat input dir and forecast gridstat input template. And you can see here the input di directory is a, a full path uh, that will not change from run to run. It references another variable input base. And then the template contains these tags that are surrounded by curly braces and have different time notation and the format to use. So here we have the init time in the format year, month, day, hour, and then a forecast lead with a format of hour with two digits of precision. Um, so given these settings, if your input base is set to my data dir and you're processing the 9Z init time with a three hour forecast lead, uh, the corresponding dir and template variables will be concatenated together and the values will be substituted here. Uh, the input base will be substituted because that will not change from run to run. And then for each run that you will process, it will substitu substitute the appropriate init and lead time to compute the full path to the file that is expected to process. Similarly, with observation input to gridstat, we have obs gridstat input dir and obs gridstat input template. And it looks very similar here, except um, it's referencing the valid time instead of the init and lead. Um, so with this example, same init and lead time, the valid time is 12Z computed from the init and lead. 
um, and the values will be substituted accordingly. Uh, MET configuration settings. Um, so as, as John mentioned, many of the MET applications read settings from a configuration file. Um, the default configurations are read first, and then after that, a, if a configuration file is provided on the command line, then those values will be read, and any values that are set in that file will override the default values. Um, this image on the right is an excerpt from the GridStat default configuration file. So you can see various values, model, description, ob type, um, set here, and, and these are the default values that will be used if, if they're not overridden. Um, some of the MET plus configuration variables correspond to variables in these MET configuration files. Um, so the MET plus variables are typically named after the MET configuration var variable and the MET tool name. So here on the left, we have a MET plus variable called grid stat desk or description, and that corresponds to the lowercase desk or description in the grid stat config. Um, the MET plus wrappers provide a wrapped version of the MET configuration file, and these files contain environment variables for each of the variables that you can set via MET plus. So on the left, you can see the default config file, and on the right, you can see the wrapped version. And instead of um, model equals being provided here, um, there's just an environment variable called MET plus underscore model. Um, so in your MET plus configuration file, if the variable is set, then the environment variable in the wrapped MET config file will be overridden with the setting. So here, if you set grid stat description equals my value, then from the wrapped version, this MET plus description variable will be substituted with description equals my value, and it formats it properly with quotation marks and semicolon at the end. Um, if this variable is not set, then an empty string will be substituted for the environment variable, and the result of this would be the default value in the MET default MET configuration file would be used instead of any value that would be overwritten. Um, in user configuration files, um, again, these contain settings specific to the user and their environment. Um, we have the output directory, which is set by the output base, and that's the directory to write output data, logs, et cetera. And this will be set from user to user, um, typically to a directory where you can uh, you have write access to. So this should vary from user to user. Um, then next, we have the location of the MET installation to use. That's controlled with the MET installer variable. Um, and that is the path to the directory containing MET. Here's an example from the uh, user's guide that shows sort of what the directory structure should look similar to. Um, so in this case, you would set MET installer to user local MET. Um, typically, when the MET plus wrappers are installed on, in a shared location, um, the value of MET installer is, is sort of set in the defaults to the corresponding version of MET that, um, that, is, that corresponds with uh, the coordinated release version. Um, so there'll be a sort of a default version that will be used. Um, but there are many cases where a user would want to change the value um, of this to use a different version of MET. Um, a good example is if there's a new beta release that's been uh, that's come out, and um, that that includes some changes to the tools that were not available previously that are needed for a use case. Um, then a user can set this in their user configuration file to point to that new version, and they can use that to test to make sure everything works properly for them. Um, th these user configuration files can also contain other user preferences. Um, one, there's many, many options, but one I'll mention that I think is very important is the log level, and that's the verbosity of log output from the wrappers. So if you set log level equals debug, you'll get a lot more output information, and that can be used to diagnose any issues that you may run into. About two minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Um, again, I'll repeat this slide. The MET plus users guide is a very useful resource. I highly rec recommend navigating there and at least reading through the system configuration section as it covers, uh, it contains information about what I've covered here and, and a lot more. Um, it's very useful to kind of know all of the different settings that you can control through the wrappers to, to know what, what it's capable of. And here's a link provided at the bottom. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? All right.
Um, let's see. Is there anything left unaddressed in the chat? Time for a question or two. All right, then seeing none, that actually puts us right at the end of time where we exactly need to be. So we are going to take a 15-minute uh, break, come back here with a uh, session of talks beginning at 10.15 uh, or 12.15 out here in the east. Um, Tara, is it the same Google link or is it a different one? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the same Google link. I'm checking really quick. It, it is. Yeah. All right. So that means you can stay here and take a bio break, get a drink, and meet back here in 15 minutes. Yes. See everybody in 15. Thank yeah. you. Terry, are you still there? I almost left. <laughs> okay, I just, I, I've been having trouble with my sound. Suddenly the sound cut out. I just thought, oh my gosh, I can't hear anybody. All right, I just want to make sure. I, I switched uh, browsers. Um, I'm back on Chrome. Uh, oh. and my apologies. I thought I turned my camera on. I thought I had my camera on. I will